So hello again, everyone, and welcome to those of you who came in during the during the set. Happy to see you. Are there any questions or comments about the the meditation or anything before we move on? Okay. I don't see any hands, so I'm just going to jump into this. Again, thank you to um, San Francisco Dharma Collective for the invitation to be part of this uh, series of talks and on wise action and how we show up in the world. And I, I called my talk uh, Standing Firm in the Dharma, because that's what uh, the Dharma has enabled me to do is stand firm and act as a foundation as I move into the world and deal with what's uh, happening all the time. Uh, a number of years ago, I committed or made the commitment to be rel relevant in my teaching. And so there's sometimes there's this idea that there's the real world and then there's the meditation world and that they're separate and you're supposed to keep them separate. And that's not true. What I have found is that meditation I practice to enable me to be in the world and, and what's in the world is, is part of my practice. What my experience is, um, uh, I can't separate the two. It's, it's, uh, it's, it makes no sense. And um, the Dharma, actually one of the, one of the definitions of Dharma is the way it is, the way it is. And so I think that's really important. Um, and I've been sustained by the Dharma. And as I mentioned, and it's interesting because there's been pushback over the years. And as I've, as I've, I've, as I've brought, um, the reality of the world into the Dharma hall. I had one person say once during a class I was teaching that he hadn't come there for politics. And I wasn't talking about politics. I was talking about something that had happened in the world, whether it was, you know, the, the uh, uh, shooting in Orlando or the shooting at the church in Charlottesville or something that is so real and in our face or, and he's like, oh, that's not what I'm here for. And it's like, I don't know what else there is. I don't know what else there is. And so um, it's really important. It's really important in my practice to, to make the out there in here all the same. So um, I feel really comfortable in that and I have found a home in the Eightfold Path and I've found a real home in uh, uh, the, the, the part of the Eightfold Path that talks about wise action, which is why I was tickled when they named this um, uh, series Wise Action because I find that the precepts are a way to uh, move through the world with strength. And I also am ticket, and so I feel really comfortable in that, and I feel really comfortable talking about that. And I was also um, thrilled that I saw somebody posted last week on Facebook, Analio. I don't know if you know who Analio is. He's a he's a monk. I, he's a great scholar. Uh, he um, he wrote a book on the Satipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, which is really, really excellent if you've not seen it. And that was his PhD dissertation, which became a book. And he just, he just put out an article last week, and it's called um, Confronting Racism with Mindfulness. And so because he's a scholar, he did all this research and I was just tickled because I'm not going to do this research. And he speaks Pali. I mean, he reads Pali and Chinese and he's an expert in all the texts. And he, he went through this, um, uh, 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 he went through the texts, a lot of the suttas, and he brought out the, um, uh, he lifted up the texts that talked about how the Buddha was um, opposed to the caste system and back in the day and it wasn't the caste system wasn't as entrenched at that point but there are a number of suttas where he points out that there's no difference among human beings there's difference among birds and animals and other critters but human beings all have this ability to awaken 
there's there's just no difference there's this real teaching of equality there and there's another sutta that's one of my favorites the one where uh you know we're told that um just as we care about ourselves deeply other all other humans care about themselves just as deeply so we should treat other human beings as as preciously as we treat ourselves i'm paraphrasing that but there's again that teaching of equality and so there's that um that foundation in buddhism and he and he has all these suttas that point it out and he also talked about um mindfulness is as a tool and i loved it and when katie was reading the introduction to this um uh, uh to this class that mindfulness is a tool for uh internal awakening it's internal practice and it's really important to begin to um see how we are conditioned and that we have these fixed ideas and that it can be used in this process of seeing how we are impacted by um, conditioning, by the systemic conditioning, the, 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 the systemic racism and systemic, all kinds of systemic oppression that is, that is driven by the greed, hatred, and delusion of the world we live in. And so it's, um, it's really important that, and I mean, mindfulness is this, ex, ex, exquisite tool that we use and he and he and he says a few things and he quotes a few people he said um it's a clear there's a clear need for those not directly suffering from racial oppression or oppression to broaden their perspectives through mindfulness and become fully aware of the larger context so we can see how we are internally um impacted by this conditioning and we also turn outward to see how the um, uh, the world is impacted by this conditioning. And um, he says, although from a Buddhist perspective, the aspiration for non-harm um, would already suffice for arousing a sincere concern about directing mindfulness to the consequences of racial bias, it can additionally be helpful to keep in mind the broader repercussions of racial oppression. And just right now, we're seeing that with the, the um, disproportional impact of COVID-19 on, on, on people of color in this country because of the economic and the, the historical um, um, uh, prejudice and bigotry and systemic disenfranchisement of people of color, black, black people, brown people, uh, non-white people. So to see how that impacts and this racism impacts everyone, um, it's really important uh, to recognize that. So this practice is teaching us that it's not just internal, but it's also external mindfulness to see how we are impacted and again, bringing it out to how it's impacting everyone. And then there's this one other quote from this book, Deep Diversity. So there is clearly thus there is thus clearly a need to take responsibility and become active. Um, given that in a society where racism exists, it is not enough to be non-racist. For real transformation to occur, one has to actively challenge di discrimination in all its forms. You know, we have to be aware of our biases and then we have to be aware of the biases and how they impact out in the world. It's incredibly important. So mindfulness, this practice of mindfulness is how we do that. This sitting on the cushion, which seems like we're navel gazing, but we begin to see how we're entangled, we're enmeshed in this, uh, just because of how we are, uh, 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 the society we're grown up in, in our families, the things we hear, the things we read. Um, I sat a retreat with the nuns from Aloka Vihara. And I know the nuns, they have been involved with the San Francisco Dharma Collective. They're great. And um, Ayananda Bodhi is Welsh. She's from the UK. And uh, Aya Santa Chita is Austrian. And they became U.S. citizens in December. And Aya Santa Chita said, we're U.S. citizens now, so we're taking on the cultural karma. 
So we have this cultural karma that we're part of and that we have to um, um, uh, pay attention to. So uh, we all have that. And um, how do we go about developing that? Um, how do we utilize this internal awakening and how do we go about external awakening? Seeing internally and seeing externally, paying attention internally and paying attention externally. So beginning to see how, um, uh, well, first of all, you just start where you are and um, seeing the oppression that exists, seeing the systemic oppression that exists in our, in our world, um, really paying attention, putting aside our fixed views and seeing the water we swim in. That's really important. And there's a lot of that happening today. There are so many resources, so many resources out there. And I know you can avail yourself of those at any time. But mindfulness is not just about that. Mindfulness in, uh, is very important in helping us to hold the emotions that arise as well. Um, it's so easy to get into a place of spiritual bypass and that's what happens. Sometimes we use spirituality as a way to not feel and say, oh, you know what? Um, we are all one or whatever the, the, the thing is. Um, uh, I've had pushback on that when we had, um, when we were at against the stream and we started a people of color group and people are going, but we're all one and we have this and we started a queer group and they're like, Oh, but we're all one. And, and it's like, yeah, but you have to understand there's the absolute where we're all one and there's no difference. And yes. And then there's the relative, there's the reality of the world we live in, which is, um, driven by greed, driven by hatred, driven by delusion. And there's a lot of greed and there's a lot of hatred and there's a lot of delusion right now. There has been, and, and it's in our faces right now. So to notice that, to pay attention to that. And so um, being able to, mindfulness enables us to sit with the emotions that might be arising, the feelings that we may not want to hear that we, excuse me, that we may not want to feel. Um, grief. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of mourning. And this practice gives us the ability to hold that or to touch it. Sometimes it's so overwhelming, you know, we have to just maybe put our foot in the water and then bring it out hold it, touch it for the first time, bring that friendliness to it, bring that compassion to it. And grief is so important. It, what is it? There was a man named um, Mark Brackett who wrote a book on grief. And I heard him with a, in a podcast with Brene Brown. And he said, grief is the heart's natural response to loss. And we grieve to allow ourselves to feel the truth of our pain. And when we sit on the cushion, with turning off the distractions, sometimes grief shows up. Sometimes grief shows up when we're just walking around. How do you hold it? How do you make space for it without turning away from it? It's so important. And mindfulness is the practice that enables us to hold that. It's true. And then and another, another thing to hold is anger. That's also incredibly present right now. You know, and, and I hear a lot that people have been taught, they grow up in families that say anger is not okay. And somehow we get the idea, and this is Buddhist, Buddhism has an interesting rap about um, there's no desire and there's no, you know, we basically you're robots. And if you're not a robot, you're not a good Buddhist. And that's nonsense because we feel. We're human beings. I'm not awakened yet, so I'm still going to have these feelings. I, I'm practicing. But um, so we feel anger. Anger shows up. Anger absolutely shows up. Rage shows up. I talked to, there's a lot of rage. How, but how do you hold that without being consumed by it? This practice of mindfulness has enabled me to not be consumed by things. It's to hold it wisely. 
Um, you know, and it can be a spark to action, but you don't want to be consumed by it. There's a teacher, um, uh, the Reverend James Lawson, who I've, uh, who's down here in LA, but he's been teaching nonviolence uh, and social action and social justice for years. He worked with um, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King in the 50s and 60s. And he talks about, and I think he got this from Gandhi, he talks about not becoming that which you're fighting against. Don't become, don't start, you know, taking on the characteristics of, the, of what you're fighting against, against the oppressive, the, the oppressors. It's really important and mindfulness helps you do that paying attention to what's present and holding it. I've had anger hang out in my chest for months and months and months at a time. And I'm like, okay, here's anger, but I'm not gonna walk around punching people. You know, I, I think this is my, um, my theory is that a lot of those folks who ha went to the you know, state capitals with their guns and said, open up, I need a haircut or, or whatever it is, they are not able to hold their, sit with their emotions. Because this, this is a, we're, we're in a really painful time. There's a lot of really powerful emotion that um, needs to be tended to. And a lot of people don't know how to tend to it. There's, we've been trained in distraction in this country. We've been trained to look over there. We've been trained to blame. We've been trained to do a lot of things, but be with. And so uh, a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of these things are showing up. And we, this practice has, has given me an ability to hold it without causing harm. And so that is the next piece of this um, um, allowing the Dharma to serve as a foundation. There's the internal mindfulness, but how do you, um, what I would say is when you're able to be in touch with these emotions and really bring some kindness and compassion to your experience, because you want to, you don't want to sit there with a, uh, you want to be able to touch the grief, to touch the anger with friendliness, with kindness, with compassion. It's a natural, this, the, these emotions are a natural response. You can't help what shows up. How you hold them, how you work with them is your responsibility, but you can't help what shows up. And so there's this compassion. And when we're able to connect with reality, what the real experience is, and bring some compassion to it, the blinders fall away. And we can, can begin to see, um, uh, uh, what's going on and begin to show up in different ways. And that's where um, Sila shows up for me, the, the, the practice of, of uh, the second, the second um, section of the Eightfold Path of uh, wise action and uh, wise speech. And really it's, it's kind of summed up in the precepts. And um, the precepts, the first precept is not to kill. But it's not just sitting in your house and not killing. That's pretty passive. There's a, there's a fuller picture of it. And it's like, don't just not kill. But if you see suffering, work to end it. It's, it's a call to action. Work to end it. Um, if you, you know, that's what it is. We work to end suffering where we see it however we can do that. And um, the precept about not taking what's not offered, you just don't sit in your house and not steal. It's about cultivating generosity. How do you give? And it's not just financial generosity. It's about what can you do? How can you get involved? What makes sense for you in your life to work towards ending suffering? Um, and speech, why speech? Not not lying, not um, you know, not causing harm with your with your communication. It's not just sitting in your house and not not lying. It's actually saying what needs to be said. This is such an important one for me. This is a foundation that has been bedrock for me, because I I grew up in a 
I grew up in a family where it wasn't okay to say things that might not be received well. So I learned to just not say anything or just be pleasant all the time. And um, when you're fighting against um, things, when you're fighting against injustice, that doesn't work. So practicing this has been a real foundation. And, and when I'm in a place of fear, because if I'm going to say something that is, um, I'm afraid it's not going to be received well, I just kind of, my whole inside just tightens up like a pretzel. And I used to just run away or not say anything, but I know that's not, that's not this, that's not my path in the Dharma. And so I have to recognize that, bring some kindness and compassion to it and say what needs to be said anyway. This is finding foundation in the Dharma. This for me has been bedrock. Um, it's really important uh, to, to, find that place for you that makes sense. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, but we have to do it. Um, and this Charles Johnson is a, he's an author and he's also a Buddhist practitioner. And he wrote about right conduct, which is wise action that it translates Dharma into specific actions of social responsibility. It translates the Dharma into social responsibility. How do we show up in this world and make a difference when we see hatred running rampant, when we see greed running rampant, when we see this inequality, this oppression, this systemic racism and, and misogyny and, and all the the, the uh, insanity that's happening. How do we show up? There's also, um, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a young man in South Africa a number of years ago who he died, he was born with HIV and I think he died, he was a young teenager, he died of AIDS. And he said, do all you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. So as we don't, um, we don't have to be grandiose. We don't have to do, you know, super duper things. We just have to put one foot in front of the other and do what we can with where we are, with what we have. That's really important. And it's really important to recognize that it takes time. This stuff doesn't get taken care of overnight. I hear a lot of people, um, they have expectations about this work and expectations about what they need to accomplish. And then there's frustration when, when you do all this, take all this action and do all this work and it doesn't work out the way you want it to, but that doesn't mean you stop doing the work. I heard yesterday, well, yesterday, they, I think it was yesterday that the Redskins announced, they, the Washington Redskins announced they were finally gonna change their name. And it was yesterday in 1968, when a Native American group first brought it up. So that's 52 years that they've been trying to get the name changed on a football team. That, in the big scheme of things, that's not that huge, but it takes time for this stuff to happen. And this gentleman I mentioned earlier, the Reverend Jim Lawson, who talked about not being, not becoming that you're fighting against, that which you're fighting against, He's like 93 and he's still out there doing the deal and he's not complaining about it's not fixed yet. I'm going to die soon. It's not done. He's just saying, this is what we have to do. Here's the work that's in front of our face. Here's what we have to do. And it's, it's inspirational and it's extraordinary. Um, there's another teacher, some of you may know, Bhikkhu Bodhi. He's a monk, another monk, another, uh, he's translated many, many, many of the suttas. And he has a quote that uh, I found, gosh, years and years and years ago, which I still find incredibly inspirational. And he's talking about the Dharma um, and, and uh, well, let me just read it instead of paraphrasing it. Shh. Kevin. Kevin saying meow. Um, 
if Buddhism in the West becomes solely a means to pursue personal spiritual growth, I am apprehensive that it may evolve in a one-sided way and thus fulfill only half its potential. Attracting the affluent and the educated, it will provide a congenial home for the intellectual and cultural elite, but it will risk turning the quest for enlightenment into a private journey that, in the face of the immense suffering which daily hounds countless human lives, can present only resigned quietism. It is true that Buddhist meditation practice requires seclusion and inwardly focused depth. That's the inward mindfulness. But wouldn't the embodiment of Dharma in the world be more complete by also reaching out and addressing the grinding miseries that are ailing humanity? So the Dharma is complete with this outward facing work of ending suffering where we see it. It's all about ending suffering where we see it. Um, so, so I, I mentioned a couple of ex, uh, a couple of things to be careful about. It's like watch the expectations that you have. This is Diana Winston, a teacher, wrote uh, about how to be a bodhisattva, and she said you have to think in geologic time. I mentioned that it's going to take a while. Um, do what you can you know, with where you are, that's really important. Start where you are. You can't start anywhere else but where you are. Where are you right now? What's your internal makeup? What's your internal conditioning? Work on that. What can you do around you? Work on that. Educate yourself. Education and, and seeing the big picture perspective is so important. History is so important, seeing the history of, of oppression. You know, that's why it was so cool um, reading that article by Inalio going, here's what was going on. Here's how Buddha talked about the caste system. You know, this is what it was like. This is, and, and, um, and so you see this broad perspective going back 2,600 years. And see the, you know, see, understand the, um, uh, educate yourself about, incarceration and educate yourself about police educate yourself about all these things it's really important to have a big picture and not necessarily just what you read on social media it's not always true 99% of the time but not always so um, and take care of yourself it's really important the fifth precept is about not taking intoxicants that lead to heedlessness because that then all all the other um, precepts are out the door but Thich Nhat Han has this beautiful uh, uh, elaboration on the on the fifth precept where he talks about watch what you ingest watch what you take in period, not just drinking and eating. Well, yes, drinking and eating, because it does have an impact. But what do you read? What do you listen to? That's just as important. And take care of yourself. You can't, you can't be fighting all the time. You have to, to work and come back, work and push back. I mean, uh, move and come back. And, and, and self-care is really important because not causing harm includes not causing harm to yourself. That's really important. That's really important. So um, there's one other thing I want to read. I have it on my website. And this is uh, um, from Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. And she says, much of what is taught is the acceptance of a kinder, gentler suffering that does not question the unwholesome roots of the systemic suffering and the structures that hold it in place. What is required is a new dharma, a radical dharma that deconstructs rather than amplifies the systems of suffering, that starves rather than fertilizes, fertilizes the soil of the conditions that the deep roots of societal suffering grow in. A new dharma is one that insists we investigate not only the unsatisfactoriness of our own minds, which is internal, 
but also prepares us for the discomfort of confronting the obscurations of the society we are individual expressions of. It recognizes that the delusions of systemic oppression are not solely the domain of the individual. By design, they are seated within and reinforced by society. So again, that's a teaching on both. You, you really can't separate one from the other. If you separate the one, that internal only, I, you become an automaton. You absolutely become an automaton. In my, that's my opinion. Because um, that means you're just cutting off, you're, you're cutting off part of your awareness. If you don't see how you are perhaps part of the harm or that there's harm that needs to be ended, it's um you might be part of that so uh oh and then this last little piece i wrote a while ago it says our practice offers us inner resources for social action this practice allows us to to take it off the cushion to do what needs to be done so now i'm done so I'm happy to see if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts and um, and I'm also happy to break it into some groups so you can have some conversation among yourselves. So are there any questions? If there are, you just have to wave. Yeah, Tanya, you have to unmute yourself. Um, those were a lot. Of, first of all, thank you very much. Um, and uh, for your thoughts and the quotes were amazing and d or is a lot of that stuff on your website? Um, the last one I read was the Rachel, I mean the Rachel, the um, uh, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams is, but I haven't, I can actually put some of them on my website. I'm thinking I want to, I want to expand some resources that I have. So I'll, I'll put that on my to-do list. Yeah. Resources. Yeah. The, and that would be great. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Anything else? No? Hey, hey, hey. That's why I always break you into groups. Into groups. <laughs> uh, can you, can you um, please spell Sila? You said you were, you mentioned Sila. Sila, it's S-I-L-A. And okay. Sila is, I don't usually use poly words, but yeah. um, that one I like. It's the second, the, the Eightfold Path is divided into kind of three sections. There's um, uh, wisdom, mindfulness, and Sila, which is an ethical behavior, which is kind of how to be in relationship with other people without causing harm. Right, okay. Yeah. And thanks. fixed views is one of the five hindrances. Is that right? Is it five mm. hindrances or is it more than that? No, there's five hindrances, but fixed views is not one of them, although it does get in your way. Um, okay. The hindrances are aversion and, and craving and restlessness and drowsiness and doubt. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. There's a lot of lists. <laughs> there's a lot of lists. So... We just make our way through them. Yeah, Ray. Yeah, I was wondering if you have any uh, tips on, <clears throat> my, my struggle lately have been, I've, I've always been uh, very involved in activism. And um, I got into, like before I would always use email activism, back before all the big social medias. So I had people that I, friends and family and whatever that I would send emails out with action items and, and things to do. Um, and then when Facebook came along and I finally succumbed to that, I was doing a lot of my uh, activism that way and posting things. And lately, like within the last couple months, it's, I have a love hate relationship with Facebook as I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, I find that a lot of the stuff that I'm posting isn't really being uh, probably as effective as I want it to be. Um, 
I think people scroll through and they're like, oh, look, more you know, uh, bad news. I try not to post things that, that don't have action items um, because we hear, all hear the same news over and over. And usually your friends are posting the same stuff that you are reading. So, um, but uh, I also suffer from a lot of anxiety. So I've been having to take breaks from Facebook and um, because there's so much you know, coming in all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had any tips on using social media in a constructive way um, or anything that maybe you've seen that, that's been more effective. Yeah, thank you, Ray. That, I don't think you're alone with that, um, that experience with social media. I know a lot of people have difficulty with it. Um, it's really, it's one of those parts of the, the, the fifth precept that Thich Nhat Hanh expounds on. Be careful how you, what you ingest. It means be careful of your relationship with social media as well. And, you know, I don't know if I have any tips on social media, but I know there's other ways to be active that don't include social media at all. Um, there's ways to help. I was helping people sign up for unemployment insurance. I work, I'm on the board of this organization that works with labor unions and this one union, 99% of their members lost their jobs because they're in housekeeping. And I helped people sign up for unemployment insurance because it's really hard to do. And so that type of thing. So there's, and there's, there's different types of activism. So you might search out different groups who are doing things and there's more um, uh, specific actions that actually have a better impact because they're not just throwing seeds into the wind, which sometimes Facebook and that type of thing feels like. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Yeah, it does. And, um... I, I do a lot of uh, emailing the senators and stuff. So it's, but I'm usually what I was doing is trying to get it uh, out there more, right, you know, right, for right. other people to, to also take that action. But yeah. let go I, of your expectations. Yeah, true. That helps too. <laughs> that does. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Anything else? Maybe, yeah. Uh, one more and then we can break. Katie. Yeah, um, I'm curious about, like Spring Washam was recently talking about being very aware of um, the, not beating people with the baseball bat of wokeness, which is a phrase that I really liked. And I wonder if you have a perspective or thoughts on on kind of like, checking in with your intention and motivation for outward action and kind of having awareness around, you know, I feel like sometimes there's action coming from a place of compassion and like awareness of the necessity for change. And other times there is like the baseball bat of woke, like there's this anger behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, do, do you have thoughts on kind of checking in with yourself inwardly before doing kind of external action? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, I, absolutely. It's like I mentioned with the anger, I had anger sitting in my chest for months and months and months, but I didn't let it take over. It, it didn't act, I, you know, the, the, in the teaching it's don't say, I am so angry because what you've done is you've put on the overcoat of anger or you've put on the overcoat of rage or whatever it is. Just say, wow, there's a lot of anger. I mean, you can say I'm enraged or I'm angry or whatever the emotion is, but watch your relationship to it. And so I didn't let it drive me. And the other thing that really helps me is, is again, drawing from wise speech. That's just kind of, like I said, my bedrock is what I'm doing necessary or is what I'm generally it's with communication, but those, those, is it, is it necessary? Is it the right time? Is it true? You know, that's with communication. What's my intention? Checking in with intention is always important. So that internal practice is really, really helpful. 
it's really important, especially with a big, a, a major undertaking. Yeah. It's not just do it to do it. It's not a bandwagon to jump on. You know, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's really a, 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 a way of life. Okay, your head's moved around again. Can we you, lost you. We, you finished saying it's a way of life, and then we lost you for a while. Okay, it. I yeah, that's why I put my picture up because I, I started. You all froze on me. Um, it's a way of life. I don't remember what else they said, but it wasn't really that profound. So <laughs> it's a way of life. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. So what I'd love to do, well, we only actually have 12 minutes. So, um, okay, I think I'll, we'll break into groups of three then. And so I was going to do bigger groups. So can we break into, so does that work? There might be a group of four. That's fine. Um, so what I want you to do is just, um, the, you know, you know, just it's just maybe a reflection on on how this lands for you, or what you find is in your way, or um, you know, yeah, just just a reflection on on this for you, and and um, what I want, yeah, what gets in your way of, or what have you found is to be an obstacle, or what has have you found to be um, a, a real inspiration. Um, one or the other of those. And so there'll be three of you. So that'll be like a um, couple of minutes each. Uh, you can time yourselves. Um, so share for a minute or two, and then the next person can share, and the next person can share. And we'll bring you back. And I, if you don't know Zoom, once we say you'll be back in a minute, it'll automatically bring you back. You don't have to come back, um, you know, close your call. So. Um, we will see you in about um, nine to 10 minutes. We it's magic. Everyone's back. Yay. Well, thank you all for being here. Really, really uh, appreciate it. I want to just honor the time. It's straight up nine o'clock, but don't, there, th this is just the first in the series. So come back next week. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's next week, but maybe it's Pawan is next week or Somebody, it doesn't matter, but you can go to the SF Dharma Collective website and, and the, the, the whole list. And so just every Tuesday night, it's for the next several weeks, it's going to be about how, wise action and being in the world. So um, thank you, my friends. Um, I, you can, if you have questions, you can write me Mary Stankavage at um, dot, Mary at Mary Stankavage dot org. And I, I'm also... FYI, I'm going to put an advertisement for myself doing a starting a drop in group on Saturday women and whiteness for women to investigate their experience with race. So that's on my website, marystancavage.org starting this weekend. So um, and I do morning meditation 7am every day. So come sit if you want. Otherwise, that's enough commercials for me. Um, but so happy and SF Dharma Collective has a ton of stuff a ton of stuff, which I'm sure you all know. So don't miss out on the good stuff. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, be kind to yourselves, be kind to each other, and I will see you next time.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow Thanks morning. Everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.